Welcome back, everyone, to theCUBE's coverage here in Las Vegas for AWS reInvent 2024, our 12th year covering Amazon Web Services, watching them grow from building basic building blocks to now full-blown you know, cloud systems. And with Gen AI, it's really looking at a, a full distributed computing market with high-performance computing now. The center stage is all about performance and the big story is infrastructure, but really around multiple environments. We've got a great segment here talking about kind of multi-cloud, multiple environments all happening at the same time. Dimitri is the co-founder and CEO of Emma and Sid from Gartner to break it all down. Gentlemen, thanks for coming on theCUBE here at reInvent Day Day One. Day Zero is yesterday. Absolutely. Great to see you guys. Yeah, so, absolutely, thanks for having us. So multi-cloud is kind of a reality. We've been calling it super cloud, some of them call it other clouds, but at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's a distributed computing environment, yep. just different vendors. Amazon's got a big ass cloud, so does Google. They're, so you got this big, you know, demo democratization of supercomputing you're seeing, but the apps at the end of the day, people just want to write better apps. So, you know, if I'm JP Morgan Chase or I'm a big customer, yep. I'll use whatever cloud I best runs my workloads. True. That's the end of the day. So let's get into this whole multi-cloud. So before we get into Emma, because you guys have an interesting solution I want to dig into, Sid, break us down on the marketplace because you know what has now become recognized is that we have heterogeneous market, how does multi-cloud look like from a customer perspective and how are the vendors playing in that, the big whales? Absolutely, John, yeah. So we're seeing an explosion of the adoption of multi-cloud. It's been happening over time. The thing to keep in mind is that multi-cloud doesn't mean every workload is multi-cloud. Uh, we predict that, you know, I think two years ago it was 75% of organizations were multi-cloud and we're predicting 90% at the end of this year, we're almost at the year now. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the, one, uh, the one thing I want to point out uh, when I say those numbers is even if an organization has one workload that's multi-cloud, that counts in the number, right? So it's not like 75 or 90% of workloads are multi-cloud. That's a clear distinction we need to make sure we understand, right? So that brings the question, begs the question, you know, why are people going multi-cloud? Why? Because workloads are getting more complex, the ones that are being moved into the cloud. And the primary cloud provider, although may have all the capabilities to service that workload, it may not be best in class. So let's take an uh, example of an algorithmic trading application, a uh, hedge fund in downtown Manhattan, right? Uh, it primarily runs on Amazon, let's say, mm -hmm. but it may need an analytics engine from, from Microsoft that could be Power BI as deemed by the owner of that application. So now you're leaning into a second cloud mm -hmm. for Power BI, and as an artifact of that, Microsoft would probably say, hey, my Power BI runs best on Azure, so you got to buy some Azure IaaS. So, so that how second cloud kind of fits in the context. And then the owner of the application may say, I want AI capabilities from Google for that particular application. So now you've got a primary, secondary, or tertiary. That's the highest running use case that we see in the industry for multi-cloud. Yeah, it's interesting, um, to meet you. we're here at AWS and we've heard the narrative over the years. Um, and even Andy Jassy, who made an appearance for Matt Garman on stage here at the event, He's almost saying multi-cloud, but he's talking about the models. They announced Nova, and he's like, everyone, you can't use one, you gotta use. So again, so the reality, he says, this is how the real world works. You don't talk to one expert, and he's talking about models, but like, at the end of the day, that's the way the environment is. Customers have choice. Yeah, so I'm totally with you guys. So look, uh, customers, they find themselves in a multi-cloud reality because of different things. Sometimes they acquire the different companies and then, okay, so you acquire the company because of the business metrics, not because of the environment you, you utilize, right? So, and you deploy your applications and at the end of the day, so customers, they don't want to care about the underlying infrastructures. They want simply to run their applications. They want to scale their applications. They want to leverage different infrastructures. And even if we're talking about a high performance compute and all these like GPU training models, et cetera, et cetera. So again, sometimes you also experience the lack of the resources on the marketplace, right? Mm -hmm. Imagine you need like five accelerators, top accelerators from NVIDIA, and you see with your current provider, you have only available five and you need 12. So what are you going to do? And so multi-cloud helps you here to combine the different resources from the different cloud service providers and utilize them. So leverage these resources as a commodity. So let me ask you a question, Dimitri. I know you guys talk about this a lot and I've heard you speak about this complexity. Sure. I mean, the vendor lock and that's a whole nother discussion, but let's talk about complexity because one of the things you're seeing is more complexity comes about from trying to manage resources across multiple environments. Forget multi-cloud, but like, add that in, you got edge too. So as you look at distributed computing or cloud operations, how do you look at that unification when you have more complexity coming? I know you guys are addressing it. What are some of the things um, that people can do to deal with this? Is AI going to abstract away complexity? So what are some of the strategies people are taking 
say, okay, I want to have heterogeneous choice, but I got complexity blowing up. How would you how would you answer that question? Uh, you can go if you want. Yeah, go ahead. Do a quick answer there. I'm sure. sure they have a solution that kind of gets to that yeah. end state, right? And I I don't know their solution, so I'm going to talk it from a yeah. gardener point of view. Um, so we look at multi-cloud as a desirable architecture, right? Adoption model. The reality is people struggle with it, you know, how to make it work. Many reasons, people don't have the skill sets, tools don't exist, etc. So at Gartner, we've defined something called the cross-cloud integration framework. Right? Mm -hmm. How do you connect these clouds in a seamless fashion, right? And through native APIs, rather than going through some sort of exchange provider, right? Yeah. Uh, that's a more kludgy solution rather than native APIs. So if you talk about networking, you're talking about exchanging, you know, border gate with protocol, routing tables, and things of that nature. Through APIs, mind you, not getting to the bowels of the implementation of yeah. that secondary cloud provider, right? And that's the sort of the fundamental of the cross-cloud framework, the base, pla base functionality. And then we talk about a layered cake approach. So we talk about cross-cloud uh, data, cross-cloud security, right? Cross-cloud and federated GNI, let's take GNI since the hot word of today, <laughs> right? So you have Bedrock from Amazon, you have uh, Vertex AI from Google, and you have Azure AI from Microsoft. I'm a consumer of all three clouds. I bring an AI workload. I don't have to struggle with figuring out which LLM from which API should be accessing these things yeah. and bring it all together. That's the idea of a federated cross-cloud GNI model, right? And then above that, you can have you know, cross-cloud data, uh, sorry, applications and cross-cloud business outcomes. So it's a layered cake of yeah. sorts, starting with interconnectivity. Or, so what's the progress in your view on how, what, da what data you guys sharing, can you share around how people are making progress with this? As a sure, yeah. so Is Google was the first company that implemented uh, our cross-cloud framework, and they are now something called cross-cloud interconnect. You may have seen that at the last Google Next yeah. conference. So Google has uh, done it. We've seen sort of instances of where Oracle has worked with Microsoft, has worked with uh, Amazon recently mm -hmm. at the Oracle World Conference. I think you were there, Matt, Matt Garman and Larry yeah. Ellison were on stage. Who would have thought that this would happen, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, so these things are happening today, right? But again, those are a little bit sort of pairwise. Oh, froze over on that day. It was <laughs> <laughs> like one, 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 two, one solution. It wasn't Jassy, it was Garmin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we want to see a many-to-many -many solution where you can connect yeah. any cloud to any other cloud and make it work. And that's the idea of a cross-cloud framework. Great. Dimitri, what's your angle on this? Obviously, you're in business of unifying people's platforms together. What's your take on complexity? So, no, 100% agree. So, what we've built, we're building, we've started with this networking backbone. So, we understand that the clouds, they should be interconnected, like you said. Mm -hmm. So, otherwise, you cannot eliminate the vendor lock-ins. You have some incredible egress costs. So, you cannot freely transfer the data back and forth. You cannot actually migrate your workloads. So, you're locked in without the network and backbone or interconnections. And on top of that, you can build whatever software you, you want. So basically everything that on top is an overlay. So actually internet is an overlay on top of a network. Cloud is an overlay on top of the internet. So I mean, this sort of things. So this is your question. If I'm a customer and I don't want to have lock-in, how can you help me? What do you guys do for me? If I say, hey, I want to have more choice, um, do I interview the fr do a framework like cross-cloud like they're recommending or do I build connective tissue between clouds and write that myself within my platform? Do I build a platform on them and then have a platform cut over? What's your advice? So, what, do you guys, what do you guys offer? Take us through your, your Yeah, pitch. I mean, my advice, go and sign up into, into the platform, right? Because yeah. all these cloud service providers, they are already interconnected. So basically, we took your framework and we've built a networking, like hardware networking backbone. So you built the yeah. cross-cloud framework? Yeah, so, I mean, we've built the way we think it, that should work with our platform, right? But this is a cross-cloud framework where all the providers are interconnected. And on top of that, all these managed services and, uh, and, and applications that cloud service providers, they build in, they are also available for, for you. So you can use them, combine them, leverage any whatever best of breed services. Who's, who's, who's purchasing that platform? Is it the platform architect? Is it uh, who's the who's the person making that call saying, hey, the one is it coming from the data side, data engineering, DevOps teams? Is it coming from the platform side? Is it coming down from more of the business people saying we got to make more cash? Yeah, uh, we, 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 you know, we mostly work uh, with a with a cloud architects and a site reliability head of site reliability engineers because these guys they care about the 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 applications and the workload that these workloads they are up and running twenty four seven. 
Yeah. And yeah, I mean, we also work in a, in a cooperation with the FinOps guys and, uh, and DevOps engineers, because these guys, they need to validate your product. And, yeah. and for them, we, we provide the, the familiar tools. So for example, they can leverage our API gateway with their Terraform scripts to deploy their work. So you're making like their life easier. Fun. Yeah. That's the pain point. So sure. the platform folks are, are, the, are the main pain yeah. point. Okay, yeah, so okay, now let's get to the reality on the market side. What's the, uh, the uptake here in terms of traction generally in the enterprise? Because I see mainly the enterprise being a big yeah. customer here. I mean, I think the, what I want to point out here is that in the past it was more of a engineering exercise, right? Uh, because sort of like, like uh, Dimitri said, and the IT folks get together to try to f figure out how to bring these things together, how to stitch it together, which tools do you. But what we're seeing changed today mm -hmm. These edicts are coming from the board level, right? The boards are asking, hey, you can't, it's too risky to be on one cloud. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, the workloads are very complex, right? So it's not a DR strategy as such. Yeah. Some people confuse multi-cloud as a DR strategy. It is not. Yeah. We rarely see where 50% of IaaS business goes to one provider, 50, the other 50 goes to another provider. That never happens, right? Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. boards are saying, our workloads are complex. We have to make sure we are using the best in class capabilities. Go figure out which of those cloud providers can do the job for us, right? And then the work obviously is done by the IT. I know folks in the IT folks, right? They're looking for tools to stitch these things together. So it's not uh, it's not a hundred percent risk management from a recovery standpoint, yeah. but it's kind of risk management from a supplier standpoint. Right. You're saying exactly, exactly. Okay. So yeah, so that I'll, makes sense. We don't want to put all of our eggs in one basket. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, also <laughs> your basket may not have the best fruit that you want to eat. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. We're preparing, we're preparing an apple pie. You want the best apple, right? Yeah. That particular basket may not have that best, best of breed apple. Could be another basket, right? That's the idea. I, I think what validates your premise there and, and your solution is, is that we're seeing on the hardware side. Remember the old days: make a motherboard, ship it, put it through manufacturing, bang out a bunch of yeah. servers, rack and stack it. Now every single company has got end-to-end -end workloads that have unique characteristics that That's need. True. Bingo. certain things yeah and that's end-to-end -end. now you're adding more data into it okay, that's going to change things for sure yeah. and that's why we see like in the kubernetes world that that those platform engineers are like they're freaking out because when stuff breaks they have to deal with it so you solve their problem yeah we solve their the problem. market problem at the business side is kind of top down bottoms up you got the board level dictating down look at we want to make cash with gen ai we see that future but let's clean house first yeah <laughs> i think gen ai is a great example right? because you know, you're not going to replicate uh, LLM data across all these different cloud environments, right? So yeah. data is not going to move around. A, it's impossible to do that. And B, data egress charges are humongous, right? You just can't do it, right? And we're seeing the advent of what we call, you know, domain-specific and industry-specific LLMs that are being created. I think Matt talked about it this morning. From yeah. these frontier LLMs, right? You take a very large yeah. general purpose LLM and it creates specific domain-specific, industry-specific yeah. Uh, purpose-built, private, secure, running in a world guard environment. And those things have a very different need. So in order to federate that data, to achieve that, you need a cross-cloud framework. You yeah. have, have to have a multi-cloud It's called distributed computing. If it's, it's, done, if it's done right, yeah. Yeah. it should run wherever the data is. Why should yeah. I have topology? It reminds me of the old mini-computer days. Yes. Everyone had proprietary NOSes. Yeah. Going back, we're dating ourselves now, yeah. Dimitri. But <laughs> I remember back in the 80s, you know, the dominant players before the big um, yep. open systems wave in the 90s was, you know, IBM had proprietary network operating system. DEC had one, all the big players, and the interoperability was, was, was horrible. You couldn't run. You had to run gateways across. So I think we're in an era now, if we don't get to some unified cross-cloud interoperable framework, we're going to be living in siloed stacks. Sure. And, and, nobody wants and that's a disaster. Exactly. It was always like this, starting from the internet, disconnected yeah. different campus networks, then TCP IP appeared, then different networking companies, they had their own standards and protocols. And I mean, then they have agreed, okay, let's build this VXLAN, EVPN VXLAN thing yeah. to do the overlay networks. And then, yeah, we have the same problem with the clouds. The nice thing about this, Dimitri, I would say, I'd love to get your thoughts because you, you started the company around this and you talked to customers deploying and Sid actually doing great market work over the Gartner is that we have open source right now was that living in a time where that's the checkpoint. It's almost the check to power. It's almost doing the journalism job of keeping the vendors alive. Open source has been a great scenario. Yeah, there's been some things that have happened with, <laughs> with but, but I think in general, the collective intelligence with open, yeah. take us through your thoughts on how 
you know, your world evolves, what a customer's thinking about, because I hear the big enterprise, they're also contributing to open source. If you look at some of the best open source environments, the corporations are contributing. Why? Because they want to hire more people. That's true. So my personal opinion that open source is an important thing, is an important like, movement as such. And uh, of course, at, uh, in the early days, you can gather more people if you're building something incredible to, to support your ideas. But again, so you should be careful with that. So us as a company, we also support an open source project. And we also have a certain pieces of our platform which are available and open source. So you can basically take, for example, an automation tool from our platform or CLI is purely open source. But on the other hand, sometimes when you play the game and you change the rules, a hawk, like it happened with the other... Yeah, this blowback. Yeah. That big blowback. Well, you got to eat the... Eat the concept. Sometimes it's perverse incentives, sure. capitalism, and VCs and whatnot. Um, talk about why you guys are winning, and you when you roll out with your customers. Obviously, you're, um, we are just riffing on this. Obviously, the market conditions for cross cloud and interoperable yeah. is working. This demand, demand there architecturally. Why why are you guys winning? Why do people work with you? So, great question. Several several aspects here. First of all. So platform engineers, they appeared because they failed to find a platform like ours on the marketplace and they realized that they have a lot of requests from their developers and they need to build something simple internally so developers can ship their code and applications faster. So basically that this is what Emma does, cool. right? So we when we target these guys, yeah, we that's, tell them. That's more beer time for them. Yeah. Is they, Direct quote on the cube, I had one developer, like, what is AI doing? It gives me more beer time with my friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, beer time, that's a new metric. So that's the first thing. So here it is, the, the solution that works. Yeah. Secondly, so Emma is like a free of charge platform because we work only in case we provide you with a, with a, with a certain success. So if you, we reduce your cloud bill, that we charge you. If not, so you pay nothing. This is something that also um, attracts our customers. Yeah, because they're all skeptics. Because yep. they're, like, they're like, no one can solve this problem. Okay, yeah. try it. Yeah, yeah, you know? give it a try. Yeah. So I, I say skeptics in a good way. It's compliments, not really for sure. So normally what we hear is like, okay, guys, you can do networking, you can do deployment, you can do automation, you can do cost management, you can do observability, and you're like six years old company. Come on, it's too good to be true. We, don't, we are not hey, willing to pay you. What's yeah, the where's, catch? where's the cash? <laughs> we say, okay, get it right. <laughs> Free of charge. So yeah, those those things. And, and on top of that, the, the infrastructure management is boring stuff. So everyone wants nowadays to, to work with an AI. They want to like- They want cool stuff and yeah, tools. And, and again, so our platform eliminates this, so we can automate this this yeah. routine, right? And they can um, start doing cool things. All right, Sid. The final question to you is: Also, you're keeping track of the horses on the track um, in this market uh, of platform engineering converging with foundational setup for a next gen run of the cloud slash on prem edge. Call just call it distributed computing, where apps are going to need to run anywhere, everywhere, and you're going to have computer vision on cameras. You're gonna have to have data. Architecture's completely changing. What's your take of the horses on the track in this market? What's the, what's the prospects? Uh, you mean vendors or just Vendors just in, in general, is it gonna be popping, growing? Is it gonna slog along for a little bit and then kick up? What's your vision of how you see yeah, it working? I, I, I think, I, you know, I have a slightly different point of view on this whole topic uh, or the question that you asked. It's not about technology. It's not going to be about technology. It's going to be about outcomes. No CIO wakes up in the morning and says, I'm going to go buy some yeah. <laughs> Gen AI or, you know, cloud. Uh, if I'm the CIO of the city of Paris, I wake up and think of building a smart city. How do I build a smart city? I sprinkle IoT sensors everywhere, collect a lot of data, and move that data into the into a, you know, hyperscale edge, like, a, I don't know, Amazon Wavelength, the Google Distributed Cloud, whatever. I do a lot of application processing there. I may have some Gen AI inferencing capabilities in that state. Yeah. I, that stuff that I can't do on that edge, uh -huh. I ship it back to my nearest cloud provider's data center, which might be in Frankfurt. How do I do it? If I have a terrestrial connection, that's great. If I don't, I'm going to use 5G with high bandwidth and low latency. I do some data analytics on it. I do some training of the data using GNAI functionality. And I come up with some KPIs and metrics that I empower my police force and my fire department with. Now what I've done is I've come close to building a smart city. In the yeah. process, I use multiple technology in a combinatorial fashion. Yeah. That's what's going to be yeah. the big deal in the future, in my opinion. Yeah, I've always loved the um, the cloud model of building blocks. Because you're getting it, because you basically want to work back from a solution. What am I trying to do? Right. What technology fits? Exactly. And that's heterogeneous, open wins. Guys, thanks so much for coming on, Dimitri. 
Said thanks for coming on. Appreciate it. Congratulations on all the great work you're doing at Gardner. Good to see you back on the Cube. Absolutely, John. Pleasure. You know, always have so, pleasure. Gardner expertise. Of course, we're getting all the action from the floor here. We're in the press area. We're getting all the action. We had all the top executives coming in. Also, the top newsmakers. We have people coming from the stage. We have J.P. Morgan Chase. We have the CEO of Page of Duty coming on as well. She's gonna. She was on stage, highlighting her startup success. They like not a startup anymore. So we'll be back after this short break.